once the wills are done, what rules are you leaving in place for the family in terms of the ongoing conduct of a business or investment portfolio? And that seems to be the new trend. People want more. Yes, they've divided everything evenly between their children, but how is the business going to be conducted afterwards? How are those siblings going to carry on? Is it going to be like a board of directors? Is it going to be unanimous? Do they have to stay together? If one of them wants to sell, do they have to sell to the other? They're the top types of rules and things that people want to put in place now. And what are we trying to do? What's the whole aim of doing this? No different to a partnership, isn't it? We're trying to avoid disputes between the partners. So we're trying to avoid disputes between our kids and that seems to be the number one sort of desire. So probably the best way to talk about it is an example. And this one's a pretty, very, you know, typical family in the sense of they haven't been divorced. <laughs> They've got four kids. Now, these people got going with their kids very early. They actually came up to their 40th wedding anniversary very soon. But they've got a 37 year old. Um, she's married with somebody who works outside of the business, a fireman, and they're expecting their first child soon. She was a career sportswoman. The next daughter's a lawyer, married a real estate agent. They've got two kids and they're just about to have the third. Their third daughter is just finishing off her third degree down in Sydney and looking forward to her fourth degree. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't seem to have a permanent man in her life. And the youngest, um, he's stopped looking like a boy, he's six foot six, and he's working in the business. So everything's going pretty well with this family, and mum and dad have got a real desire to keep everyone together. They love their family being around them, they love seeing their grandchildren. And the sort of the, the questions they've got, it's, it's a real estate agency, the actual business. As we just said, this son here is working in the business, and this son-in-law is working in the business. So he's been working for one of the big agencies down in Sydney and he's returned to um, work in their business but again he wants to make sure that he's got some sort of a future because he's saying hey I'm at that age where I should be managing or owning my own um, agency and I need some certainty. This daughter here after she has um, this new child is looking to get into the business maybe, hasn't made up her mind. Uh, business is probably worth in terms of the rent roll just using those sort of standard numbers, probably one and a half million dollars. And what would you get for a real estate agency, just the sales part of the business? <coughs> because it's so commission driven and sales driven, typically they're probably worth maybe a hundred thousand dollars, that's it. So not a great lot of value in the sales business, but obviously in the property management, quite a lot of value there. Now, coming up for their um, 40th wedding anniversary, <laughs> he's 54. <laughs> And um, he's looking to retire, been very successful in this business. And he's saying, okay, we need an income stream for the next few years, but after that, you know, we can hand this business over. We're, we're sort of right in terms of our superannuation and our other investment assets. Um, we'd love to sell the business to our son and son-in-law. But what's the problem? They don't have any money, do they? <laughs> You know, in terms of, do they have the one and a half million dollars to buy the rent roll? No, they don't. And mum's worried. Mothers never worry about son-in-laws, do they? <laughs> mum's worried that her son-in-law is pushy and that her daughter sides with him. So yeah, that's a little thing in, in the back of her mind. Um, the son-in-law is happy to work there in the business, provided he's got some sort of a career path forward. Obviously he's talking about ownership in the relatively short term because he thinks okay if it's not this agency I need to get into another agency. And mum and dad want to sort of stay involved because they want to stay involved with the family. So pretty sort of common scenario isn't it really. Um, what are the options that we've got here? You can have an outright sale of the business can't you? To the kids sort of on commercial arm's length terms or the other option would be to retain it, wouldn't it? Until your death. And only pass it under your will through to your kids. They're the two extremes, aren't they? Now, if you're dealing with people with no dough and you're looking at that commercial sale, you're talking about vendor finance, aren't you? Has anyone seen that actually work? <laughs> 
you know, when you do the numbers and you say, okay, well, they can pay for the business with the after-tax profits, well, by the time they take out their dollars, it's just not possible, is it? There's just not enough left. Or you're talking about a period of 20, 25 years, you know. So it's not really possible. So you need some external funding or you need them to at least have a good deposit. The parents, notwithstanding they want to, you know, pass control of the business on in the day-to-day -day management, they still want to retain some control and particularly mum's concern, they don't want to give away the business to the son and the son-in-law just to see it, you know, having to buy it back from a son-in-law if there's a divorce or a daughter-in-law if there's some sort of divorce. So the model that they've gone for in this particular one is they're saying, okay, why don't we just hang on to the business in terms of we'll keep the shareholding in our name for the rest of our lives, but we'll enter into an agreement now whereby we're promising these kids that we'll leave it to them. Now we'll break the business up, we'll give the rent roll to the four kids equally, so we're treating them all equally. But in terms of that sales business, which has a much smaller value, we're going to leave that to the son-in-law and the son. And when we say we're going to leave that to the son-in-law, we're leaving that to the daughter, aren't we? <laughs> we're not leaving it to our son-in-law. But in terms of our son-in-law, we're going to give him a path forward where he can see that he's going to get his market wage, his profit share. Um, and with that, over the five years, he's going to get 100% of that sales profit of the business. So he's going to go from his market wage and bonuses through to the point where he's getting 100% of that and sharing that with his brother-in-law. The property management income is still going to keep coming back to mum and dad. Um, by doing it this way, obviously, when it passes under the will, there's no duty and there's no CGT. So you've got that saving. And we've got certainty in the sense that it's recorded in an agreement. Um, and we've been able to split the business into the two parts so we can treat them all equally. But in terms of this sales business, it's worth $100,000 and that's a real question mark because you're really getting the benefit of the sales that you're generating yourself and not too many employees or um, they're very uh, commission driven employees. The family constitution just records that the sales part will pass to the son and son-in-law. What's a precondition to that though? Well, we can't say you stay married, can we? <laughs> but we say you've got to have someone who's got an interest in the business in terms of you know, that ongoing shareholding. So we're talking about the son-in-law, his interest continues for as long as he's married to his wife because it's going to pass you know, to his wife, not him. Rent roll passed to all four. What about those ongoing decisions? What have we got? So it's going to pass to the survivor of mum and dad and then afterwards we've got four kids, haven't we? So what's the likely outcome? Either they all agree and vote together, so it's unanimous, isn't it? Or we get that situation of two versus two, haven't we? Because we've got two outside of the business at the moment and two in the business. So we've got that deadlock, haven't we? So in terms of this agreement, we've got to have a way of resolving if there's a 50-50 vote. And of course, we're going to refer that to an expert. They can all have their case and the expert will make the decision and they can't appeal from that decision, they're stuck with it. The idea of that though is, it's a quick you know, process. We're trying to avoid litigation because we want there to be an ongoing relationship between the children, don't we? You know, where you're saying, okay, you get your chance, you go away to the independent expert, you put your case to them, and then that expert makes a decision. So it's a way of making sure that that goes forward. Um, there are some things where everyone must agree and that's a sale of the business. And again, that's probably protecting those that are in the business. Liabilities over 50,000, purchase of a new business, wages for family members. Um, they're the things that are covered, disputes covered off. What else do we need to cover in this sort of situation? What typically happens when four children inherit a business? <laughs> one, either they keep on carrying it on, you know, like some of the successful families we've seen around, or one uh, family takes over, don't they? So we've got to have an exit mechanism. 
So if you do want out, you don't want to be with your brothers and sisters, um, what's a period of notice that you have to give? I don't want to be involved in the rent roll anymore. And we thought, really, because that's a passive investment, a relatively short period, okay, you give three months notice, and that gives the others time to get finance together to buy that interest out. If you can't agree the price, there's a default valuation me method, and there's vendor finance terms. So you only have to come up with 50% of the price up front, and 50% over two years is what's built into this agreement. So that's put down in the rule book by mum and dad, probably 30 years before they die. <laughs> but everyone's working around that, aren't they? Because everyone's going to sign this agreement and they know what, what's involved. The other terms that we have in it, um, the sales business only comes to them, provided all the property managements are referred back to the agency, sort of common sense. Um, who signs cheques, they've just got some mechanism for that and they've allowed a provision where the oldest daughter can get involved in the business if she wants to. She's got a three year window after the birth of a child to, to put her hand up to say if she wants to get involved. By having that rule book though, in writing, we're not relying upon a discussion that happened in a hotel, are we? Or a conversation that was had over a morning tea in yeah, 1995. This is something there, and they've all been, um, been able to discuss it. So once this document's been drafted up, they have the family meeting, they obviously involve mum and dad, the kids are there, that's the initial meeting, and then they involve their spouses as well. So it's a bit of a process. Um, another provision is that they're going to review it every three years. So they're going to have a look and see, okay, what's changed? What needs to change? Has there been any change in circumstances? Has our son-in-law gone back to Sydney? Has there been a divorce? Is someone sick? Um, and it'll evolve over time. Uh, we had some people today who came in and they first spoke to us about their will seven years ago. They got the initial letter and they've been thinking about it ever since. <laughs> and they said, hey, probably best that we actually get the will done and sign it so we've got something, so we've got a, a line in the sand. And that's what I'm saying. With these agreements, don't try and make them too complicated. Don't try and sort of anticipate every possibility. You really want to be able to put something down in writing, get it recorded, and then let it evolve over time. Um, another real estate agency business, they had a partnership agreement between three brothers, and they're sitting down at the table, and one of the provisions they've noticed is, the, it says, and the business will be sold on the 30th of June 2018. Now, when they, or when they signed the agreement four or five years ago, that seemed like a long time ago. Now they've realised it's only a couple of months away and they're going, are we selling the business? <laughs> they're all looking at each other and going, should we agree to extend that or should we, we not? But it's there written and, and you know, one of the partners is saying, well, why wouldn't we be selling the business? You know, that's what we agreed upon. And one's going, I can't remember signing that. <laughs> but you know, there it is in black and white. You know, the person is going, I forgot about that because, you know, I was involved in this process, but there it is. Um, disputes avoided, um, the whole family's talking about it, everyone's happy. There's no uncertainty um, that we normally get when things are not recorded in writing. Um, we also talk about, sometimes people get um, caught up in whether it's a shareholding or whether it's a trust or whether it's a partnership. What we're talking about here is it's an agreement between mum, dad and the children. We're ignoring the entities, the lawyers and the accountants can fix it up later on, but we're talking about how those six people are going to meet and make decisions about the future. Um, a different scenario here, a manufacturing family, and this is a bit different. We've got a, um, a family owning, the Smith family owning 60% of the business, and the Jones family owned 40%. Now, the Jones family is the key employee, and he's been the key employee for 30 years. In fact, he runs the business. <laughs> the Smith family are very much into retirement mode. They pop in each week, and they do their token visit and have a look at the books and things. But this man and his family run it. Each of them have got, well, Mr. Jones has one son in the business, and Mr. Smith has two sons in the business. This son here gets on very well with this fellow here. So what's dad worried about in the future for the business? What's this fellow always come to see Mr Smith about over the last 20 years? I'm a minority interest in this business. 
I'd really like to have a shareholders agreement, a partnership agreement, so my minority interest is protected because what can Mr Smith do? He's got 60% so he can vote through anything he wants, can't he? So everything's been with unanimous agreement, but he's well aware that he's in a vulnerable position, so he wants a shareholders agreement. Mr Smith knows that he's in a, uh, you know, a controlling interest and he's saying, yes, we must talk about that agreement, we must do that, and he's been doing that for 20 years. But he's aware that his sons should have an agreement because he wants to make sure that they always vote together. Because if this son splits off and votes with this fellow, control of the business shifts camp, doesn't it? So he's entering into an agreement while he's alive saying, if you ever want to take up your shareholding in this business, you two boys have to vote together. Okay? And if one of you says yes and one of you says no, again, it gets referred off to an expert to make a decision about how they're going to vote. Um, but they must vote together. Exit. He's saying, okay, if one of you wants out, the other person must buy it. And he's saying, okay, look, there's no better way to work out who's going to buy than if you name the price, then I've got the choice of selling at that price or buying at that price. So, you know, lots of mechanisms for working out valuation, but in this one, the father said, okay, whoever wants out, they name the price, and then the other brother can decide whether they buy or sell at that price. So it's a surefire way to make sure you're very honest. When you have a valuer valuing your family business, do they get it right? A lot of the time the only person who knows the value of the business is you, isn't it? So that's why we're sort of trying to keep it within the family, because um, they know the most about it. Again, um, they've built into it deferred. You only have to come up with half of the money up front, and then the other half over two years. Um, again, in this case, interest-free and payable in equal instalments. The Lopez family. Again, only been married the once. Two girls, two years apart in age in their early 20s. They're all very close. But Dad's worried. Um, he wanted them to sort of agree um, or put something in place where there was a mechanism that they'd never have a fight about money. So there's a, an ongoing business that he doesn't think they'll be able to operate and he wants that converted into passive income as soon as possible. Um, but he wants them to do it in a way that's practical. So with the investment portfolio, he's sort of saying, you'll make more money with all this money together. But if for whatever reason you have a fundamental difference and you want to split it up into two parts, you can do that. But I want you to do it in a sensible way so you're going to minimise your stamp duty, you're going to minimise your capital gains tax. So I want you to get some advice and do that. In terms of the business, if it hasn't been converted over into passive assets by that time, then it's a subject to a right of first refusal for the other sister. You know, if you want to sell out of your part of the business, yep, that's no problems. But you've got to sell it to your sister and there's um, terms on which it can be sold. Again, what they're trying to do is avoid those disputes that they've seen others go down in the future. So just putting a mechanism in place. Increasing communication. We've spoken before, you know, in, in the 70s, people used to get their wills and hide them. They were top secret, weren't they? Notwithstanding, they said, I'm going to leave everything to mum. Then I'm going to leave it to you kids equally. They were always sort of filed away in a filing cabinet. Today, the discussion is much more open. Everyone's talking about it because there's no surprises. Um, issues come to the surface and are debated. So we're talking about that 54-year-old man, his wife's 54, the kids are 37, not likely to die for 30 years. So they've started the conversation now about the succession of the business. So I think it's a good thing. Um, you get certainty if you've got a plan. Um, you get less, you know, no fear of others' actions. And one other extra thing is um, we're talking about the business today um, where those people are seven years they've put off making their will. They've got a manager that manages the whole operation. They're now able to say to him, hey, if we die, everything's status quo is going to be maintained for 12 months. You know, you won't have to worry about resigning and running away. Um, the kids inherit you as well in terms of that arrangement. So you've got that um, ongoing certainty for employees. 
it's like a, rule, um, a partnership agreement. The reason why partners have a partnership agreement is not that they ever intend to rely about, upon it, but it's a rule book and everyone sort of conducts themselves around it. If you don't have that rule book, then you can have the fights. Um, also with parents, it makes parents bite the bullet, doesn't it? Because you've got to know what your income stream is going to be for your retirement. <laughs> you know, you've got to make sure there's sufficient there for you. You're handing over the business. Okay, hands off, I'm not going to get that income anymore. Do we have sufficient? Because obviously that's going to dictate when um, it takes over. They're a new trend. Um, almost every time where there's a, a business, a family business, um, people want to talk about it. Why? I think, you know, obviously with increased wealth, superannuation, housing prices and things. But statistically, someone told me there was something like 16,000 businesses for sale in Australia. <laughs> of that, 5% will sell. And I think a lot of the time there is that that value is hard to realise, isn't it? The business is so centric around the operator, the relationships that they have, or it's just something that's not saleable, you know, in our traditional sort of sense um, that you can take it to the marketplace. So if you want to get full value for your business, it may not be selling it to outsiders, but letting the family continue to run it, showing them the secrets and how to do it. Um, people have more complex structures, um, and tax and duty considerations, obviously, are, are big um, negatives. If you sell a business and you've got to pay half or a quarter of that away, that's obviously going to affect your ongoing ability to um, retire. Um, and again, going back to that um, first example, that family really wanted to keep all their grandchildren together, all their kids together, and happy, and they didn't want money to come into the way between them all. So they seem to be the reasons why these things are being done.